Before the bumbling adventures of the cat, or the devilish musings of the Grinch, there was Hitler. As Hitler rose to power in the 1930s, diplomacy and politics failed, and the guns and tanks weren't doing much better. A relatively unknown American cartoonist, My name is Ted Geisel, made it his mission to fight Hitler the best way he could, through caricature and satire. In 1936, 32-year-old Dr. Seuss took some time off work to vacation in Europe. As a third-generation American with German ancestry, his shock and disgust for Hitler led to a gradual realization of German guilt and a deeply personal sense of duty to fight Nazism. At the time, Americans weren't sure if they wanted to opt into a war 3,000 miles away that didn't directly involve them. This time America should keep out, and I know I will. We cannot win this war for England regardless of how much assistance we send. That is why the America First Committee has been formed. Dr. Seuss opposed the war too, but he believed America was going to have no choice in the matter. He began writing and drawing for PM, a liberal newspaper in New York City. From 1940 to 1942, he authored more than 400 political cartoons criticizing Hitler, American Nazi sympathizers, and America's isolationist movement. While he had obvious criticisms for Hitler, he also focused his efforts on those who would downplay Hitler's power or motives as harmless. He often had harsh judgment for American armchair warriors who deemed the war not our problem. After Pearl Harbor and America's official entry into World War II, he felt PM's first mission, to get America into the war to support Britain, had been accomplished. He began designing posters for the Treasury Department, and soon joined the U.S. Air Force as Captain of the Animation Department for the first motion picture unit. Working with artists like Frank Capra, Mel Blanc, and Chuck Jones, he created animated shorts aimed at helping American troops understand their role in the war effort. His 1945 army films, Your Job in Germany and Our Job in Japan, provided inspiration for a commercially released film called Design for Death, which earned him an Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature in 1947. Copies of the film are thought to be rare or non-existent anymore. After the war, Dr. Seuss settled in Southern California where he pumped out the work he's best known for today, more than 60 children's books like The Cat in the Hat and The Lorax. While Dr. Seuss moved on from political cartoons, he never lost his worldview. He realized he could instill a deep set of morals into a broader and more timeless audience by abstracting the characters and ideas into his children's books. At one point saying, books for children have a greater potential for good or evil than any other form of literature on earth. Horton Hears a Who, in 1954, advocated for sticking up for the little guys who can't defend themselves through a push for internationalism and anti-isolationism. His 1953 book, The Starbelly Sneetches, yeah, yeah, your belly's got no star, is a thinly veiled critique of the social division caused by requiring the Jews to wear a yellow Star of David in occupied European countries and Nazi Germany. In his 1958 classic, Yertle the Turtle is a power-hungry fascist who manipulates and oppresses his population to gain control of more land. The book is loosely based on a 1942 comic he drew for PM. At the time, he considered giving Yertle a mustache, but thought it would be too transparent. We can learn a lot from Dr. Seuss. Fifty years later, his children's books are still relevant. Even some of his political cartoons are becoming relevant again. Among others, Dr. Seuss stood for acceptance, understanding, and togetherness. He showed that just because we have differences doesn't mean we are different. In a world where everything has a label or a symbol meant to differentiate or denote status or class, should we really focus on how we're different or how we're all the same? <laughs>